From England to Poland, every step across the ocean, the ruling classes, them is in a mess. Oh yes, the capitalist system are regress, but the Soviet system now progress. So which one of them you think is best? When are the two of them the workers are coming? A warm welcome to you at home to yet another exciting episode of Workers' World with me, your host, KD Mashile. Thank you for joining us. In, the week, in this week's show, we discuss women in labor. That is, what the role and situation of women is in the economy and how their interests are represented by the trade union movement. We'll look closely at the extent to which discrimination against women in the economy are still rife and how the trade unions respond to this. It is well known that women are marginalized and oppressed on various levels of society, from our families, our communities, and in the economy. But we also explore whether they are marginalized and oppressed within the trade unions. With us to help unravel this topic, we have a group of gender activists joining us. And right next to me, we have Ms. Rivda Ajam, who is the Deputy General Secretary of FEDUSA. Welcome. Thank you very much and good evening to your listeners. Next, we have Ms. Prakashni Gavinder, who is a labor analyst. Thanks for joining us. Ma Thank you. Good evening. And alongside Ms. Gavinder, we have Ms. Valhelmina Trout, who is a retired gender activist. <laughs> Thank you for making the time to be with us, ma'am. Yeah, it's my bedtime, but I'm glad to be here. <laughs> <laughs> and also in the round table, we have Ms. Sharon Daniels. Thank you for being here. Thank you and good evening to everyone. A very warm welcome to all our guest speakers this evening. So to kick off this discussion, we have a very broad topic, it seems, but we just, I just want to orientate um, the viewers on what the role of women actually is in the economy. So Ms. Rifta, can you please just take us through where women are employed right now in the current trends um, of women's role in the economy? Well, thank you. That's an extremely difficult topic to engage in in the short period of time that we have available. Yeah, I think we would mm. need the rest of uh, the broadcasting show to unpack um, the overall sentiment. Um, but uh, if I can uh, just try and summarize it, I think from our perspective, um, the role of women, not only in society, but in the trade union movement, is simply far too understated. Mm -hmm. uh, fundamentally, I think of, and the only principle that resonates right now is that of Watinta Bafazi. Mm. You strike a woman. When you think about women once again, overall in society, you think about the fact that women perform two thirds of the world's work. Mm. Whether it is in industrialized economies or in developing nations, women carry the triple burden. Mm. They raise families, they have to manage their households, and equally so, they have to earn an income. So, as I've alluded to, far too understated, but um, I, will, I will hand over to my colleagues um, just to add some further dimension. Thank you. Well, I think as Rifta pointed out, it's a very, very broad question. Um, simply put, women are involved in all sections of the economy, but if, if, you, if you express it that way, it sounds too positive. Um, the reality is that South Africa has a very high unemployment rates and the unemployment rates for women are even higher. And those women who are involved, uh, who have work, tend to be more open or more susceptible to unemployment because they're involved in particular sectors that are more vulnerable, such as, um, like as domestic workers and contract mm -hmm. cleaning or even in the farming sector, for example, mm -hmm. they will be more vulnerable than, 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 uh, than men. Mm -hmm. And they also tend to be concentrated in, in those sectors that are considered to be like the caring professions, like for education and healthcare. Mm -hmm. um, and, and there's also the additional problem of in the informal economy as well, you know, informal trading and those kinds of things, which, uh, you know, which means that um, their job security is insecure, mm -hmm. as well as the income 
um, they have poor income security. Mm. Um, I actually want to piggyback on what you both said on women being actually understated or maybe some of their work not actually even being recognized. So w how do we qualify the work that women do at home? Could that somehow be quantified? Is it, could it actually even be a form of slavery to say that women are doing domestic work without being um, paid for it? What are, what are your opinions on that? I, th I think for me, um, just listening to the other two speakers, um, the the fact that we do a lot of unpaid work, you know, like you say in the home and in community, we even volunteer mm -hmm. within that community without, you know, um, being paid for that type of work. And really, um, you know, our government do doesn't even recognize that. And I think it's about time that us as women, you know, we come together and stand up against that and demand mm -hmm. actually from our government that we get some form of income for the work that we're doing. And then you have the working women, um, whether in the formal or in, in informal economy, um, you know, you have to go back home and continue to do that work. So your, your job is actually never done, Double, yeah. you know. So, um, yeah, that's just, just my input on that question. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, what I'd like to add is to say that yes, housework, care work, it's, that's all been it's seen as the invisible work and so mm. it's called the invisible economy. But um, feminists have always argued that without that work being done, the formal economy cannot go mm. forward. So I agree that um, in terms of this invisible work, that it's, that it's not uh, recognized or mm. not paid, um, that, it sh that it should be recognized as being and playing a vital role in the economy. And then I just wanted to add further and say that, so your question was about women joining this economy and where are they, but we mm. need to just recognize because we do want to bring out, you know, that um, the gender discrimination. Mm. And so we need to recognize that women would be entering, like men, um, a capitalist economy. Mm -hmm. A capitalist economy that is, that also is, is, is grounded in patriarchy that keeps women in a situation of dependence, whether it's in a marriage or whether it's in the economy, whether it's socially or politically. So we just need to be mindful of that, mm -hmm. that um, it's a capitalist economy that uh, doesn't put people first and, and reinforces women in a situation of dependence. Miss hmm. Prakashni, I just want to ask this from you. Um, what what are the I what are the inequalities that we still see in the workplace today? Um, because I mean, we speak about it quite broadly, but I I, I just want to ask from your work: mm -hmm. are th are there improvements in the inequalities that existed, say, for instance, with regards to salaries and the kinds of positions women get, or are we still at a standstill with that? Well, I think there has been maybe some progress, not enough. Um, we, we have an Employment Equity Act, which we've had for some time. Mm -hmm. um, but mainly that has had more benefits, I think, for individuals, especially in higher income positions, mm -hmm. who are able to challenge, for example, discrimination on the basis of pay or the fact mm -hmm. that they were unable to um, mm -hmm. access work because of pregnancy and those kinds of things. But you find that lower down um, in, 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 in lower income sectors that women mm. are really struggling. So the Employment Equity Act hasn't had a, like a, a more impact on, on a structural basis in terms yeah. of, of, of equality. And besides um, pay, I think the discrimination is much broader than that. Mm. The mm. fact that women, um, for example, um, have to take on parental responsibilities or are subject to maternity have to take maternity leave, for example, mm. means they're often disrupted from work. Okay. So people don't think about the fact that with all their disruptions, they don't actually have a chance to, for example, build up um, pension funds mm. to the same extent that their partners do, um, mm. whereas mm. they're actually enabling their partners to build those things. So the, yeah. the, the inequality is actually much broader than just the question of equal pay or, mm. uh, or discrimination in terms of accessing yeah. work or being, being dismissed on the basis of, of, of gender. Mm. And I just now I want to actually ask this to the two ladies who actually are in the trade union space. So what exactly is it or rather to what extent is the Employment Equity Act really assisting women in the workplace with regards to these challenges? 
um, I'm not sure which one of us, but, uh, <laughs> you know, we are all, uh, you know, mm. activists in our own right. Um, yeah. Sharon equally, you know, still very much actively involved. Um, but I would say that as much as the Employment Equity Act has been brought about to redress the imbalances, not only of the past injustices, but equally so when it comes to females in the workplace, progress has been made. Mm -hmm. but it is not as effective and it is mm -hmm. not taking place as fast as what we would like to see it. Um, mm -hmm. When we speak about discrimination, but equally so when we take a look at the international comparatives and the international benchmarks, um, we are all party to the International Labour Organization and many other platforms mm -hmm. and we fall slightly short or if not, you know, marginally short in terms of where our target should be. Mm. We have codes of good practice in the workplace and, and, and like Prakashni has alluded to earlier on, we speak about um, what the codes are designed to do, but equally so, um, equal work, equal pay for work of equal value, but mm. still the onus is on women to show and prove that mm. they are able to do equally that I that see. many is doing. So why still the disjuncture in mm. terms of having to prove beyond reasonable doubt what our capabilities are? Um, the discriminatory factors, yes, there are many and um, equally so, it, it becomes very difficult and at times it becomes something that females just don't want to champion because mm. it is a matter of not only discrimination but then intimidation because whilst you have to to advance certain aspects, um, it becomes a matter of the whistleblower just not wanting to take it any further because she herself becomes subjective to a process where, for example, you have an HR manager in your workplace that is male. Mm. So how do you even go beyond the stigma of trying to convince the other party of what you are able to do and what you have been subjected to? So. Yeah. There's, there's lots that have been done, but we still have Quite too far to go. to go, yes. Yeah. Anything to add, Mr. Rowan? No, there's nothing exactly. Um, you know, the, the inequalities that one still sees, it's like um, uh, my um, sister said there. Um, just for an example, today I was at a place and there was this comment made by a male to another woman that was doing a job mm. um, saying, you know, this is this beautiful person and she's intelligent <laughs> as well. Mm. And I sat and I listened and I thought, gosh, <laughs> she's beautiful and she's intelligent as well. And mm. then, you know, there's, there's always this thing. And if you want to, um, as a woman, you are capable to do cer a certain job, you mm. know, you are either like, um, she has said now that you have to go to your HR or perhaps your manager that is a male mm. and they always think that there has to be a certain favor that they need to do yeah. for you or can you need to do that favor. Yeah. Yeah. Can we hold it right there? We are speaking about women in labor and we'll be right back after this ad break. Welcome back. You are still watching Workers World right here on CTV. On today's show, we are speaking about women in labor and the trade union movement. Just before the break, we were speaking about the different areas where women are discriminated against. And during the ad break, Ms. Prakashna, you were just saying that we should maybe quantify a little bit of what these discriminations look like. Um, could you just take us through that, please? Okay. It'll be difficult to quantify exactly. Yeah. <laughs> Some of, much of the statistics are actually not um, adequately um, collated. Um, mm. But I think one of the problems that we want to look at is in terms of the, the nature of it is that mm. there's a correlation between race and gender. So there's a you know, historical legacy of apartheid. Mm. And you'll find that, I mean, the Department of Labor often focuses on senior and top management. Mm. And there's a a lack of representativity of black women. Yeah. But what's even more worrying is that uh, if you look at even at the entry level uh, for graduates, you'll find that black women graduates are the most disadvantaged. 
which tells you that there's um, a rather a problem of what you call implicit bias against uh, those kind of po appointments because mm -hmm. it has, doesn't have to do with merit, but rather people's perception of who would add value and merit based on race and gender. Mm. So there are other reports of there being, say, sexual abuse of women in the workplace and speaking on it being also more than discrimination and being, it a, being a matter of, dis, of intimidation as well. What are the trade unions doing? And maybe we can just take this to Ms. Valhelmina and ask what, what, have, what have the trade unions been doing um, in the past, say, two decades even um, in this regard to assist women who are being, say, sexually abused in the workplace or being even let go because of pregnancy and issues around that? Okay, um, yeah. When you introduced me, you introduced me as a retired um, trade unionist. Mm. And coming here tonight, um, obviously there's a lot of history to cover, mm. but just in terms of the topic, there were two um, issues that I wanted to highlight. And I think the one that I want to highlight fits in with, with the discussion at the moment. And the, uh, the, the, the one that I want to highlight takes us right back to 1998. Okay, as you know, Kusatu was formed in 1995, 1996. And the 1998 um, landmark uh, agreement that I want to refer to hmm. is the agreement, the parental rights agreement between the then Kahusa which is mm. now Sakao, the retail sector, yes. with pick and pay retailers. It was groundbreaking in that it addressed that um, the gender discrimination mm. in terms of parental rights. And it played a vital role in, in recognizing that both parents have a role to play in um, when a child is born and mm. in the rearing of children. So it, for example, it um, gave principles or a set of guidelines mm. which were very progressive because it promoted equality between women and men. Mm. And it also was a commitment to the elimination of discrimination based on sex and gender. Okay. So we saw dealing with, um, I think it was 11 months uh, uh, paid maternity leave, it looked at, uh, that was if both the par parents were working for pick and pay, that they mm -hmm. will get the same uh, uh, privileges. It mm -hmm. also dealt with, amongst other things, about adoptive children and et cetera, et cetera. Mm -hmm. But it was l groundbreaking because it was part of the fight to, for, uh, to fight all forms of oppression and which was recognizing that gender discrimination is actually very, very f uh, uh, vital to this. Yeah. So I thought maybe it would be, you know, good to ask because right next to me is <laughs> she's worked for Pick and Pay. She's been a shop mm. steward at Pick and Pay. And to ask now in 2019, mm. I mean, that groundbreaking 1998 uh, uh, agreement, I mean, just how far has it come? Is it still implemented or have we rolled back our gains? Sorry, I'm asking you questions. You may. Yeah, I, I think that's that's such an important point that you raise, and mm -hmm. that is really something that we're very proud of. And nobody has actually um, bettered that agreement that has been signed mm. in South Africa. Wow. Um, and the agreement is still in place, and um, there's an ongoing campaign by the union for childcare yes. facilities. Mm. Um, and then also with that. Um, what has happened this far in terms of the discrimination that you're referring to yes. um, in the environment where I work at just recently, and I mean, you know, there's history and there's stats to that, but recent stats mm. where women, especially in the retail sector that are required to work late shifts, uh -huh. um, there was an incident where, and I'm not going to mention the company for that for, for various reasons, but recently there was this woman that had to work overtime and it was already on a late shift mm. and um, the manager, which is a male, demanded that she works, um, you know, an hour after the, her shift had been completed mm. and once they closed up, he got into his car, he left and her lift mm. that came, that she arranged to come and fetch her, she got into the car 
um, not realizing that it's actually not the person, um, you know, sure. that particular car, the car was similar and mm. she was raped. Oh, sure. And, um, you know, these are the things and, you know, currently um, mm. the union is busy with that and, yeah. you know, lots of support has been given to her. But that's yes. not the, you know, it's not an isolated yeah. incident. Um, at another organization as well and can we I'm so sorry can we hold this right here while we go on ad break and we'll pick up right from that point when we come back back on Workers World and we are still on our season finale where we are speaking about women in labor and their role in the trade union in the trade union movement. So we've spoken about quite a lot and I'm tongue tied at this point because just before we went on ad break, we were speaking about a very horrific incident where a woman was led to work late and ended up being raped by who pretended to be her Lyft driver. So you were still on this point, Ms. Sharon. Yeah, that's, that's one incident. And then there's another incident where um, a particular company, also a manager, more senior person, um, arranged a party um, after work. And obviously, um, not obviously, but what happened after that party was also another rape. Mm. And um, the saddest part is that it's always women that bear the brunt and um, women are often then the um, given dressed. leave or it's the way that they were dressed, dressed. or the way they mm. bent. Mm. And the, the male manager was able to continue working until, um, you know, workers and the, I don't want to say the victim, but you know, the, 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 the person survivor. that, that yeah, the survivor, that's a better word, yes. The survivor then made a noise and the mm. manager was then um, just moved to another place. Also another incident that, that also happened, um, there was an injury on duty and the female worker was pregnant and she miscarried. Wow. And um, the, bad. yeah, and then there was advice, you know, how do we deal with this? You know, just make sure has the person, how's the person's health, mm -hmm. has the company offered any assistance in terms of medical and, and those type of things. Mm -hmm. And the excuse were that, uh, you know, they broke a rule, um, you sure. know, in terms of health and safety. And this is the response coming from an HR, which mm -hmm. is a male. And then, um, you know, several weeks later, um, I did a follow up because now this, you know, thing is stuck in my head and only to find out that the woman actually died. Oh, sure. And you, you can, can you just imagine that trauma in that workplace mm. and the trauma of the family, yeah. you know? So, so these are the things that, that the discrimination sure. that, that happens, you know, um, yeah. Even just speaking about it now, it's uh, you know it's 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 quite hard, and this is the things that it we is. that we faced with. Why don't we hear about it? Yeah, I'm also wondering that yeah. why, why why is it why not? is it silent? Mm. You know, and I think f for me th uh, that is the saddest part, um, because if we look at what's happening today, I mean, the labour movement, mm. yes. They unionize, and it's good to have. I mean, you, it's, uh, you know, belong to a trade union. We encourage workers to do that. But mm -hmm. why are we not reading about these day-to-day -day happenings? Why is it always having to focus on yes, the political situation? And I'm mm -hmm. not saying we, a trade union movement, obviously, you know, gets involved. Mm -hmm. But I think the role of the labour movement they need to step up. You need. We need to have have this on this program. We need to speak about it on this program and maybe we should look at, you know, what the labor slot really is. it bringing the real news of what's happening on the ground? Because I feel as if, I mean, I'd like to hear some more of these stories. These yeah. are the stories you must hear. I, th I think also, um, you know, for me, um, I, th I think it's also about the survivor, whether the survivor also wants their story to be told. And, and I'm not mentioning any names, but, you know, it's, it's also kind of keeping that balance because how is society going to, going yeah. to, to deal with them already if society is not supportive enough? Mm. Um, you know, even um, as women, also we don't support each other enough. 
true. as well. So I think that's also something that we, you know, we need to look at and need mm. to uh, understand. Um, you know, also, a, someone reported something to a, another colleague and said, you know, I'm being sexually harassed by manager mm. A, and um, I'm just telling you, and I'm not ready to go forward with it. And the person then said, well, I will take it forward. And the, mm. the, the person then, the, the lady then said to a female colleague, um, but she's not ready yet, and we have to respect that as yeah. well. Because w I don't think that we create enough space, mm. safe spaces, you know, for yeah. women. So I think, you know, if, if, if this show and the message that we're trying to bring mm. across here is to talk, you know, for other women to create safe spaces where women can actually come, mm. you know, and, and, and survivors can come and share their story and sure. be gently encouraged. And I agree with um, with um, my elder year, my <coughs> sister, <laughs> my, my sister, and she has so much wisdom mm -hmm. and her experience. And it's because of women like her that I am here today mm. as well. You know, I'm just going back in the 1998s and, mm. and already the work that they have done there. So, um, you know, that encourages one. Um, yeah. Yeah. Sure, I'm, I'm literally like overwhelmed by this information. And I'm just, I'm just curious to ask, is, are there no legal implications also to a woman, say, going to the media before re reporting? Do you understand what I mean? Like, are there no barriers also in the Employment Equity Act? What does it say about reporting things out to the media? It's this question. I don't think there are real legal barriers as such. I mean, there's mm. always a stigma mm. that that um, discourages people from just disclosing to their you know, community or people mm. just uh, that they're close to versus, versus going to the media. Yeah. Um, but I think the, the real thing that we need to emphasize is what are unions doing? And I think there was a positive mm. story there where the union has provided support. But by and large, this has never been a priority for the labor movement. Mm. Mm. Uh, which is prioritizing women's safety at the workplace, mm. taking up yeah. in terms of their superiors, taking, it, uh, taking up the issue of sexual harassment and gender-based violence mm. when it involves be incidents between members, mm -hmm. which yes. is a big problem, yeah, yeah. Um, taking up incidents when it involves union leaders within their own bureaucracies. And just mm. about every federation mm. has had some leader who has been implicated mm. in sexual harassment. Sure. And uh, th this is from my observation and experience of having worked in labor movement. It's just actually mm. the tip of the iceberg. These are not isolated incidents. And mm. uh, I mean, uh, there is a move now to, um, mm. to look like the unions are doing something about it, especially because sure. of the, the meet on the back of the Me Too movement. Yeah. And uh, from the ILO, for example, they have ad now yeah. adopted a convention yeah. on um, gender-based violence and sexual harassment. Can we please hold it here as we just go on a quick ad break and we will be right back um, after that with the news and more discussions. Welcome back to every one of our viewers. This is quite an insightful episode, but also it is one that is heavy on one's heart because it reminds us that as much as we say, actually, when you strike women, they bleed. And in worse scenarios, they die. So while we're speaking about women in the labor movement and their involvement in trade unions, this is something that we should all keep in our minds, that we all have, a, we all have work to do in this regard. And Ms. Prakashni, you were speaking right before we went on commercial. Yeah. Care to continue from there? Yeah, um, I, was, I was talking about the fact that as a result of the global push from the Me Too movement, mm. the, I, uh, the International Labour Organization has adopted a con convention on um, sexual harassment at the workplace and um, yeah. against gender-based violence. So there is pressure now on the labour movement to promote that convention for different countries mm. to adopt it. Mm. So because of that pressure, you find that there is a certain amount of, I would say, sporadic um, emphasis on, on saying that we're taking up this campaign. Mm. But the real problem is that um, 
both at the workplace and within trade unions as organizations, mm -hmm. there is a, a prevalent problem of sexual harassment and gender-based violence. Yeah. And unions, if they want to be serious about it, need to be taken up in terms of trying to alter the culture of that, not just dealing with selected individuals. Mm. Um, and and that's, that's what we really should be placing pressure on in terms of addressing this issue. Yes, yeah, so it shouldn't actually be. I think one thing that I've picked up is how reactional a lot of things are. We react to specific cases and that blows up in the media and all of these other stories get swept under the rug somehow. Um, you also said, Mr. Rohn, that there were other examples that you had that you wanted to share with us. Yeah, I, I think maybe, you know, already just realizing what I shared, you know, mm. made me kind of emotional, so I won't go down that yeah. road. But I think um, what I want to say is, um, you know, where, where I come from, and especially in the collective bargaining space, um, when we have women that are activists within um, those spaces or in the trade union, I think, you know, we are the watchdogs to see, you mm. know, has the parental rights agreement been signed? Has the workers, have they given a mandate? What are mm. they saying about childcare facilities? Um, you know, safe transport. And I think that um, by practicing what I'm talking about, I, I, that is something that I do. Um, the, there's kind of a door that is open for us to have discussions and mm. um, in my experience men have been coming forward and asking you know um, about the sexual harassment thing they don't understand it because of culture and you know that then just creates an opportunity they want to give expression to what it is mm. and you know you you have a reaction if you um, meeting each other again outside of the meeting space or whatever they will come and say you know is it okay for me to say you're beautiful and I say if I don't take offense, then, then it's okay. But if I do and I say stop and you don't, then you know. You know, they're still trying to push that boundary. Mm -hmm. But I think it's important that, that we become that watchdogs. And it shouldn't just be um, leaders that is within the trade union, but even the workers that give the mandate. They mm -hmm. should be, when they go for their mandating process, childcare facilities, parental rights, um, safe transport, um, you know, hours worked, the areas that they work in, you know, sometimes, yeah. especially in the retail area, um, safety, clothing are not there. And, mm. you know, even us as activists or us as, as the community going into a shop, seeing that the doors are flung wide open, mm. women are sitting on tills or, um, you know, standing at the doors of security asking, you know, do you get protective clothing? Mm. You know, do they mm. rotate you? And are they taking care of you and going to the management? Mm and asking them why are you not doing that without disclosing that yeah, they've spoken yeah. to whoever. Mm -hmm. And I think that, that is something that we can also contribute in a very small way by yeah. ensuring that the discussion happens. And then also um, I find that if the discussion is not happening within the workplace, mm -hmm. we as activists, we have that opportunity in the community to sure. go and disrupt at the churches, mm -hmm. at our mosques, yeah. in community meetings, we must go and disrupt. And, and raise those issues. Mm. I actually, um, I actually agree to a large extent, if I have an opinion, um, to, with what you are saying, because it's it, it's often, and I think it has come up on the table as well, that the burden of proof is put on the woman. Whether you are proving that your job is is equ is equal to your male counterpart's job, or you're proving that you were abused, you're proving this and this and that. I just want to ask, what structures are there in trade unions? Um, maybe we can come back to you, ma'am, to ask, what are the structures that are there in trade unions to actually make sure that um, these things are addressed? So where do I go to say? now I went to my HR manager or I went to the police and nothing is really happening. Where do I go to as a worker? From the onset, I, I would like to say that um, when we address certain issues, I think that there are a lot of challenges, there are mm. many obstacles that we have to engage. But at the same time, we have to continue to bring out the positivity in terms mm. of the narratives. Um, uh, Sharon alluded to, to the fact earlier that it was actually the victim, but we mm. would like to emphasize on survivor, mm. bringing out the positive narrative in terms of the overall process. Yeah. I've also listened to your introductory remarks about you strike a woman, you strike a rock, but a woman has a tendency or does bleed because mm. of the humanistic elements yeah. that comes in. But equally so, I want to say 
that if you are subjected mm. to that kind of whatever the challenges may yes. arise, um, you find that... Let's, let's get right back to this um, when we come back from this ad break. You don't want to miss this. <laughs> Welcome back to Workers World. We are speaking about women in the labor force. And just before we went on ad break, we were speaking to Ms. Rivda Ajam. Um, please continue from that point. Yes. Um, let me try and articulate this in the best possible way. Um, a woman is like a tea bag, a joker tea bag. You can only tell how strong she is until you put her in hot water. And I think we tend to bring out the best in ourselves and we determine the strength of character by facing adversity, therefore turning it into advantage. Uh, on the aspects that we have covered, uh, Prakashni um, mentioned the convention that we as South Africa, as, as Team South Africa, had been very, very proud of after we came back from the ILC, uh, mm -hmm. uh, the conference in, in Geneva in June 2019. But the emphasis that I would like to equally place on is the fact that training remains a fundamental part of what we need to do. Mm. We cannot engage a woman that has been injured in many facets and allow the woman to be taken down this very emotional path and have somebody that misunderstands, misconstrues the whole process because ultimately you are only injuring her further. And in that regard, you finding that women subject themselves to their own emotional trauma Mm -hmm. They take the easy way out and they tend to resign from their workplaces. They cannot deal with this on a daily basis and the post-traumatic stress that arises out of somebody being discriminated, violated, abused, subjected to daily abuse is something that we need to understand in all aspects. So training is a fundamental part. Um, at FEDUSA we like to believe that we preach to the converted. So mm -hmm. when we engage, often we would like to have, or we insist on the fact that there must be a male gender ambassador. Mm -hmm. Because equally so, you are able to get the message across to the sectors that remain untapped. Mm -hmm. At the same time, from our perspective, um, we have initiated as one of uh, the federations, the fact that a gender audit must be necessitated. You mm -hmm. need to determine the extent of the membership, whether it be females, whether it be youth, whether it be people with disabilities, that needs to form the foundation of where you are moving towards. Because only in that way will you be able to take the message to the next level. And equally mm -hmm. so on the on the, on the gains that we have made in addition to the convention, the Employment Equity Act, so to the Unemployment Insurance Act has ensured that mm. uh, not only maternity leave but paternity leave can be engaged because in this new order that we, that we find ourselves in, we are finding that equally so single-headed households um, mm. take the form in, in, on both forms. And yeah. at the same time, um, the adoption leave has come into place. But yes, mm. Sharon, the stories have to be told in order yeah. to highlight the plight of those who mm. sometimes feel that they have no, no, no access or, or no form of recourse at their disposal. So it's um, quite in important. The interest, yeah, in the in interest of time, a, a very important question that I think just if we can go through the table and answer, what are the key priorities that unions should um, ensure that they go back to the drone tables and work on? We have training as one. What are the other key priorities that we can say we're giving homework as a labor show? We are saying this is your homework as the labor movement. Look at these things with regards to women in the labor force. Speak yeah, I, I think yeah. I think um, as Kasatu, there is a gender forum, and mm. you know it's made up of affiliates. 
um, that belongs to Kasatu and um, what was said earlier on about pick and pay and um, Sakao is the trade union that is um, organized mm. there. They have gender forums, you know, mm. um, from a local level, from a shop floor level up to local or national level. And I think that is the safe spaces that where, mm. where women or workers can go and report their cases. And, yeah. you know, in and the that, interest yeah. of time, I'm so sorry, can we just get just those priorities we have training we have having um a gender forum anything else i think just trying to understand the position of women workers i don't think that's ad adequately canvassed by unions okay. just understand where they're coming from what are the issues and understand that in different sectors it means different things mm. what it means to be a young woman in the workplace is different from an older woman mm. versus mothers so you you know it's, it's it's a lot more than just a question of pay mm. Okay, as as the you know, not the <laughs> yeah, I would say the wisdom, the word of wisdom, no. But just to, to look at in the past, what mm. I'd like to see the labour movement doing is uniting and mm. organising, and that training that that is the comrades spoke about. Yeah. So in the past, there was this workers' college. The workers' college brought together workers from across trade unions, across mm. sectors, across gen uh, mm. sexes. So at yeah. the Workers' College, you'll be able to, you know, get yeah. workers not to, you don't want to make women gender specialists. Yeah. You want them to be able to analyze the political situation. Yeah. We want them to be able to speak for themselves, yeah. that they don't need the academics, they don't need, they can, they can analyze, they can be at the bargaining table. Yeah. So let's look at having, having a Workers' a College that brings workers these workers college. together to unite workers across sectors. Thank you and very much to all our guest speakers and thank you at home for joining us. If you, if you missed any part of this show, parts of what some of the topics that really stood out for me and maybe selfishly as also a gender activist, I would like to reiterate that women do have a tendency of bleeding when they're struck because they are human and they have those elements with them when they get into the workplace. And some of those priorities that, um, at the table is sending to the labor movement is that we need training. People cannot report things that they don't know the proper channels of reporting. And also when they do report, they need to be reporting to people who were trained on how to deal with those issues. That coming with a suggestion to have a workers' college that is not raising up the next generation of gender activists, but actually informed workers who know their rights and know how to stand up for theirs and the rights of those around them. On top of that, we have also a suggestion to have gender forums within different institutions, as well as understanding, ensuring that we make the effort to understand what the position of women is in the workplace. This is our season finale, but we will be rebroadcasting every Thursday throughout the month of August. And we are more than, well, you are more than welcome rather to send us any information and messages that you have. And from us at Workers World, remember that a working class United will never be defeated. From England to Poland, every step across the ocean, the ruling classes, them is in a mess. Oh yes, the capitalist system a regress, but the Soviet system now progress. So which one of them you think is best? When are the two of them the workers are contest? To pull on every step across the ocean, the ruling classes them is in a mess. Oh yes, the capitalist system. Are...